We have a presentation now by Dr. Ruby Galupin de Carvalho, founder of Portugal Gems Academy. He'll talk to us about antique and museum pearls. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will try to. How do you uh, do? How do I work with this? Okay, good. Um, so, good afternoon again, everybody. And it's, thank you, Danat, for inviting me uh, to address this symposium with such a great uh, speakers and such a distinguished audiences. I must tell you that um, when I was invited to speak about magnificent and museum pearls, I just had seen at Danat's YouTube channel a magnificent presentation by Andrew Prince about precisely similar things. So I recommend it to you all to go to Danat's YouTube channel and watch to that presentation because many of the things I'm going to say today are not many, but a few are already very well documented and researched by Andrew. So uh, this is my first recommendation. When we talk about magnificent and antique pearls, we should first think about, let me press the right button. Yes, I did. About fossil pearls. Fossil pearls are not very common, and because mollusks have been available for about 500 million years, and uh, they were thriving much more after 210 million years, we occasionally, we do find pearls as fossils. And some museums do have fossil pearls on the collections, and this is one Example, it's not exactly a pearl, it is a blister. I don't know if you know the difference between a pearl, a blister, and a blister pearl, but you can come to me later after the uh, presentation and I can explain you, and maybe some other speakers will explain, will explain later. And this is a blister pearl, but at the National History Museum in London, you do have whole pearls, peanut pearls, that are aged 55 million years, so really, really old pearls. And those are actually oddities, very unusual fossil pearls. And this is one, where is the Australian uh, delegation? Oh, where should I press? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Every speaker has the same problem, right? And uh, quite recently in, in, uh, in South Australia, these two opals were found somewhere around Copper Pity, and uh, some people believe that they might be pearls. As you see, it's debatable, but uh, oh, the Australians say it's debatable, but I couldn't, um, I couldn't um, miss those because they are, even if they are not pearls, they are beautiful pearly opals. Because as you know, opal can fossilize shell, so it could be possible, but apparently it's debatable. It was, they were presented as fossil pearls, but eventually it was proven that they weren't. So fake news, as uh, people say today. So pearls in history, let me just close my jacket. It's more polite to, no, I cannot close my jacket anymore. Sorry. Um, we have listened uh, in previous presentations that the pearling has been going in the Gulf for thousands of years, particularly on this region. And um, in 2012, a very, very old pearl was found in the, in the Emirates, in the Umm al uh, site. And this pearl was carbon dated about 7,200 years old. And it was considered the oldest pearl ever found. But in 2017, a yet another pearl and a much better quality pearl, which locally, because it is pink, they, uh, we call it wardi, is it correct? Wardi, yes. And uh, a, four, a very small pearl was carbon dated, the strata was carbon dated a few uh, hundreds of years older. So in 2017, this was the oldest pearl ever found, proving that pearling was really, really very strong in the Gulf area since the Neolithic. And we see in this work that was published in 2012 uh, that some pearl findings around the Gulf from Kuwait um, and here very strongly in the, in the Emirates and also in Oman. 
So there are really, really very strong evidences, and this map has seven years old. I'm sure that the newer map will have much more findings uh, than this ones, proving that this is really, really a very old activity in the area. But can you see those pearls? This is from August 2019. And those pearls are not from the Gulf, they are from Mexico, and they were carbon dated even older than the uh, Abu Dhabi pearl. That, uh, by, by the way, if you want to see the Abu Dhabi pearl, the Wardi, is at the Louvre in the Abu Dhabi, currently on the display, on the very beautiful exhibition called 10,000 Years of Luxury, I think. And uh, I strongly recommend that, that you go there. And you can take me because I haven't been there. You, I accept. And this one actually is a very, very recent find. It's a, it was found in August, published in September. And this is, in fact, the oldest reported pearl in the world so far. I'm sure that with time, uh, more older pearls will be, will be found. So this is about the, the archaeological finds that I wanted to share with you. Uh, change? Please? Yes. We must be polite. The SSCF uh, published a couple of years ago uh, a very interesting report on carbon dating of, uh, of Indonesian pearls, and I'm sure Jean-Pierre Chalin will cover uh, this, these pearls. The, the main difference between what SSCF does and the archaeologists is the SSCF, they really carbon dated the pearl, not the strata not the deposits. So this is real carbon dating each and every individual pearl, which I don't know if the pearls that were found in the Gulf were really carbon dated or only the strata. So maybe um, Jean-Pierre can clear up uh, later on. But this is from a shipwreck uh, that was found quite recently and it was published a couple of years ago by SSCF. So the use of pearls. A similar image was already shown, very similar than this. Those are mummy portraits. People died in, the, in, the, in the Egypt and they were mummified. And in the front of the face, a real painting of their face was, was done. As you can see here, this lady. And she looked like it. And they are not usually adorned with jewelry. And you can see clearly some pearl earrings and a pearl and an emerald necklace. On those days, emeralds were known to be um, found in Egypt. And here is a very nice emerald and pearl necklace from Roman times. And we go to the British Museum and you see a lot of Roman pearls. <clears throat> and this image was already shown in this symposium. Actually, many of the images I'm using were shown or will be shown later on. And this is the mosaic um, of uh, Empress Theodora in Ravenna, in Italy, where you can see, uh, you could see, but now you can see again, please. Please? Okay. I cannot... Okay. Yeah, so I must be very polite. It must... <laughs> Sorry. And this is being filmed, so... I'll smile. Okay. Uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I, I kill you, okay? I kill you. Behave. So, now. Ah. Now you can see that she's adorned with huge pearls. And that use of pearls in the Byzantine times, in, in Central Europe and Central Asia, was really, really very common. And this is an example, please. This is an example that's on the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where you can see the use of natural pearls, and of course, uh, for those that like sapphires, Sri Lankan sapphires, or sapphires with characteristics that are consistent with Sri Lankan origin. Uh. We must be careful. Many of you uh, know this artifact. It's a very, very important symbolic artifact in Europe. It's the imperial crown of the Holy Roman Empire. And it was made on the 10th century, around the 10th century. Actually, there is a, a replica, a 20th century replica at display in Germany. And those pearls reportedly are freshwater natural pearls from the area. In Saxony, which is in Germany, in the uh, Czech Republic, in Russia and Finland, they were known to produce 
pearls in rivers from mussels, like uh, Gina Latendres told us about the natural pearls in freshwater in America. Also in Europe, we had, in the medieval times, a huge production of large natural pearls. Actually, uh, there is a bit of discussion between uh, cultural pearl, natural pearl, should we use cultured, cashy, whatever. On those days, goldsmiths, they were advised not to set on the same piece of jewelry freshwater pearls and what they called oriental pearls. So saltwater gulf pearls and freshwater European pearls couldn't be on the same piece of jewelry huh? 600 years ago. And now we are talking cultural and natural. The problems, they, they are cyclical. Interestingly, it was on freshwater mussels that the first, please, that the first attempt, okay, that the first attempt to grow cultured pearls was made. It was on Sweden, on the, on the duck mussel, local duck mussel. It's not the, the same as the European freshwater mussel. It's a different animal. That uh, Carl von Lien, that is very famous for taxonomy in biology, he attempted the first whole cultured pearls. Of course, the, the, the first one was made in Japan in the early uh, 20th century by, by Kokishi Mikimoto. But uh, this was the first attempt of whole cultured pearls in uh, freshwater mussel. And freshwater mussels, particularly in Russia, were, and until 1917, until the Bolshevik Revolution, were intensively harvested to take the pearls that were, uh, that really had a very strong symbolic and cultural uh, meaning. Uh, in northern, near, in between Finland and, uh, and uh, Russia. And those are actually Russian artifacts with Russian fresh water pearls. So, let's, let's go to the main thing that brought us here. Per natural pearls can be found in many parts of the world, as you know. This is a very, very famous collection that is called Columbus pearls. They didn't belong to Christopher Columbus, but they are called the Columbus pearls. They were studied in Danat. <laughs> There, please, one back, two back. Okay, they were recently studied here in Bahrain, in, in Danat, and they were... <laughs> Sorry, normally this doesn't happen to me, even when I'm tired. Okay. Hold on. Stop the video. What's happening? Oh, you are the... Ha, ah, she's doing it. Oh, do you want me to say change? Okay. I, when I do like this, you change. Okay. And they... Okay, 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 okay. And they were studied by Lana. Sorry about this. But after lunch, it's better to have something like this, right? Otherwise, you... And many of those pearls, they had Baroque shapes. Right? They, they could be round, but they had Baroque shapes. And some of the Baroque, some of, some of the Baroque shapes, they were used in Renaissance jewelry, making shapes of animals, making shapes, organic shapes. And they were used as drops, as in Roman times, but they were also used the Baroque shapes. And by the way, Baroque is a Portuguese word that stands for asymmetrical. Uh, but it was incorporated into the pearl lexicon as actually without axis of symmetry. And um, the Baroque shapes were actually used in this fashion. And this is a very famous jewelry that is on the Victoria and Albert Museum, reportedly for years thought to be from the Renaissance, but recent studies proved that those, this piece that looks like a 17th century piece actually is 19th century. So whenever you see a piece of jewelry that looks like something, nothing looks like something, you must test it. You must quantify every observation. The pearls are beautiful, it's a canning jewel, it's very famous, but not Renaissance, this is 19th century. Well, we are doing okay, Ayat. And uh, this is, these are just a more few examples. So Baroque pearls are, incorporated into the designs, and this is very typical of the Renaissance period. This is a remarkable necklace, also studied here at Danat, 
And uh, it's from the Albion Art Collection, one of the best jewelry collections in the world. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, yes. and uh, here is a picture of, uh, is Ken in the room? No, Ken is not here. That's why I'm talking right now and not at five o'clock. And um, this is Mr. Kazumi Arikawa showing the necklace. And look at the size of the necklace. It's massive. It's huge. And the pearls are actually huge. Another example from Amsterdam. And you see Baroque pearls over there. I meant not Baroque by shape, but Baroque by period, which means late 17th century and 18th century. And uh, there is a lot of Baroque pearls used in Baroque jewelry, if you know what I mean. And this is a very important monstrance that is in Peru, not very well studied. Uh, in, in the, do I have a laser? Do I have a laser? No. I, I, I cannot get there, as you might imagine. But you, in, in the top, you see a lot of pearls, and there is a massive pearl over there. Massive. And it hasn't been studied yet. So if you want, you can take me, and I, I go with you. No problem. Another very important uh, artifact is this monstrance, that this is on public display in Bogota. And last year, or two years ago, when Sibjo Congress was there, uh, we visited it, and uh, you see a, a lot of, of uh, baroque-shaped pearls in that part of this monstrance. And for those of you that like emeralds, you have no idea the quality of this emerald. It's absolutely stunning. Normally we see one very good emerald, ten very good emeralds, but those are hundreds of prime quality emeralds. And this is a huge... Not a huge man, but a huge monstrance. Okay? It's huge. Look at the size. Not my size, but the size of the monstrance. It's really massive. And the quality of the emeralds is absolutely fantastic. And it has pearls on the very special place. Art Nouveau pearls. And now we can click three times. One, two, three. Okay. In Art Nouveau, it's, uh, there is like a... Not a revival of the, of the use of the pearl as a pendant, but as you see in Fouquet, Ocoque, and Lalique, pearls are used again as pendants, as other gems can be used as pendants in Art Nouveau jewelry. And uh, in, uh, in Lisbon, there is a fantastic collection of Lalique jewels. If you ever go to Lisbon, please call me and I will take you there as a special visit because the jewels are absolutely amazing. This uh, very special necklace has quite big natural pearls and uh, since yesterday, Gina Latendres said that probably some of those pearls used by Lalique are actually freshwater pearls. I wonder if those pearls are actually freshwater or saltwater. I have no idea, but probably it would be nice to sort it out. So, very large pearls. There is a very famous pearl. This was published a couple of years ago, not a couple, like 10 years ago in the Journal of Gemology. The Sleeping Lion Pearl. It's a huge, huge pearl. Actually, it's not actually a pearl. It must be a blister, not a real pearl. It was sold recently for, for that amount. And why is it called the Sleeping Lion? Look at the shape. Look at the uh, very old design. It looks like a lion that is sleeping, right? And most of you know this huge, amazing blister. It's the Hope Pearl. It's huge, massive, 450 carats. Big, 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 five centimeters. It's on, normally it's on display at the Natural History Museum in London, but it was recently uh, at the Smithsonian in Washington. And why is it called the Hope Pearl? Not because it gives hope, but because it belonged to a gentleman called Henry Philip Hope. He was very wealthy. He was an avid collector of gem materials, of gemstones. He owned the Hope Diamond. You must know the Hope Diamond. And here is a very rare photograph of the Hope Diamond and the Hope Pearl together. This was taken a couple of years ago in Washington, D.C. This is another very famous and huge pearl, probably one of the biggest, largest pearls on record. If it is a pearl or a blister, we can discuss later. But uh, it, it was pre previously called the Centaur Pearl, but today it is called the Danat Sheikh Fatima bint Mubarak Pearl. 
which is uh, uh, the mother of the nation of the United Arab Emirates. And apparently this pearl is on display on the Emirates Palace Hotel. I don't know if you can confirm it. So if you go, to, if you go there, it's on display. It's really massive, okay? And uh, the centaur, it's, uh, it's like a 19 centimeter by 17 centimeter uh, jewelry piece. If you look in the gems and gemology, uh, the, uh, Ken Scarrett made a, a study on this, uh, on this piece in 2001. So it's uh, well researched. Antique and auction pearls, and I'm, uh, how, many, how many minutes do I have? 18 minutes. Oh, no. Okay, one hour I will be finished. This gentleman is not known to be uh, related to pearls, right? He's pretty much known for diamonds. He collected, avidly collected diamonds. And he had 18 diamonds, very famous. They, they, they were called the Mazarin diamonds, or Mazarino diamonds, if you wish. But he had a niece. And the niece, beautiful lady, and the niece... She felt, no, no, not, not yet, I'm, we're just enjoying the prettiness of the woman. Uh, this niece fell in love by Louis XIV of France, the king, and they were having an affair. And, uh, oh, by the way, do you look, look at the picture, and what is she doing? She's, she's representing Cleopatra, because we, most of you have known that Cleopatra, she had pearls given by her to um, Marco, oh, Mark Antony, and he and she put them in vinegar just to just to uh, annoy him. So she's uh, representing Cleopatra doing the same thing, and uh, she felt in love by the king, but then it was not approved, not approved. So she she felt miserable all her life. But the king gave her a pair of pearls, and those pearls are called the Mancini pearls because that was her name, and uh, they were considered for many, many years the finest pair of pearls ever reported. And they, they were last seen in 1978. They sold at auction by, by a quarter of a million dollars. And those are really, really nice pearls. So, you, now you, you must recognize the gentleman, Maharaja of Baroda. He's saying, oh, I, I forgot to do the dishes. Of course, he, he was very good in cleaning the house. And he was known by having a huge collection of jewelry. And his wife, the Maharani, she is famous by the, if you see the necklace, one of those diamonds is the Star of the South, uh, 128 Brazilian diamond, really, really very famous. But this gentleman, he had a row, uh, seven rows of natural pearls. Look at the size of those pearls. And this, this was not a, a small gentleman, he was a big guy. And uh, the pearls are really, really, really large. And they were, they were presented at auction uh, in 2007. They were measured, they, they, they vary from 9 millimeters to 16 millimeters, and they are really stunning in luster, in shape, in the surface quality. They are really, really stunning and matching in color. The orient, the iridescence, everything is perfect. And they sold by, for $7 million 12 years ago. So it's, it's really a, a big amount. But we have other uh, items with natural pearls that also capture our imagination and capture our eyes. And this is a very famous, one of the five existing uh, or known uh, carpets made out of, of natural pearls. And this is the Baroda canopy. It's set, by, it's set with... Uh, yeah, set with uh, almost one million pearls. It's one meter twenty in diameter. It was sold recently by about two million dollars. But there is an even bigger one, which is a carpet, not a canopy, with over two thousand and two million, two point two million beads. About one point five million would be natural pearls. You have also have glass beads and uh, two thousand and five hundred diamonds. And it was sold in uh, 2009 for $5 million. It was, but it's bigger. It's a 2-meter uh, carpet, and this is only 1 meter 20. This is a really... The, those pearls are all from here, all from uh, possibly and almost certainly from, from Bahrain. Also, the Mughals were known to gather um, emeralds and spinels and uh, pearls. So the, in, the, in the last... Uh, um, 
Maharaja and Mughal Magnificence auction, we saw a lot of pearls uh, being, being presented at auction. I really missed passing the slides. And this is one of the, how many minutes, five minutes? This is one of the most famous pearls in the world, the Peregrina Pearl. And it was, uh, it was, <clears throat> no, not yet. Okay, no, okay, I will try now. Because I have to harmonize my speech with a, and this is a really big pearl, 50 carats, okay? It's really big in the saltwater, saltwater pearl from, uh, from Panama, from that species over there. And it, it has a big provenance. It has a very important provenance from the Philip II of Spain. Now, I, I need you, actually. Sorry. <laughs> we always need help. The, the provenance is really amazing, from the kings to kings to kings. Some people say that this might be the Mary to the Pearl, but it was discovered recently that when Mary Tudor died, uh, Philip II didn't have the pearl yet. The Peregrine Pearl went to Philip II in the 1580s, and this lady, she died in the 1550s. So it's impossible that Mary to the Pearl, which is over there, could be the Peregrine Pearl. Actually, some scientists, they, historians, they believe that is this very pearl, which was uh, displayed at Symbolic and Chase a couple of years ago, and it's bigger than the Peregrina Pearl, and this might be the Mary to the Pearl and not the Peregrina. So, blah, 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 that's I said. And the Peregrina was property of uh, this very, very famous Hollywood star, Elizabeth Taylor, and it was set in, uh, it was given by, by his uh, husband in the Valentine's Day, it costed $37,000, if I remember right, and she made Cartier, a Cartier necklace with 57 natural pearls and four cultured pearls that uh, eventually went to auction, and the estimate price was two to three million and eventually sold for $11 million. It was the highest price at the time for a pearl at auction. But uh, we have news. Most of you recognize this lady. She is the Marie Antoinette. She was Austrian. She was Queen of France. She lost her head during the revolution. She didn't lose. Somebody took the head from her. Please. And some of her jewels, they were presented at auction quite recently. And this is a very famous necklace. It was sold by two million, million dollars. But this was not the most important natural pearl uh, belonging to Marie Antoinette. Actually, it was this pendant with a rather large pearl in mint condition, very perfect condition, that was presented to be costing one to two million dollars. But, so you see the scale, it's quite large, but it's not huge, okay? It was eventually sold for 36 million dollars. And this is the record so far for a pearl at auction. And not that long ago, this lady, a very famous a jewelry collector from Austria, Heidi Gershoden, she was seen wearing the pearls. So the pearls are back to an Austrian lady. So history is cyclical. By the way, this is a very famous ruby, and that's a very nice emerald. She has beautiful jewelry. I hope she's single. <laughs> pearls with stories. I, I've been telling you stories about pearls and I only have three minutes or three minutes or and a half uh, so I will run it quickly go with me so uh, I'm going to tell you a very quick story but go to Danat's uh, YouTube uh, channel and the story is all there by Andrew Prince but the Catherine, Catherine of Medici she was niece of, uh, of the Pope Clement VII which was also a Medici and she was given a big amount of really good natural pearls that she, that she then passed by, uh, to Mary Stuart, the Queen of Scots, and you can see her here wearing those fantastic pearls. And those pearls eventually were sold to Queen Elizabeth I. And this is a very interesting thing, especially for Brits. This lady, she was a Protestant, and the Pope was Catholic, so she was wearing a Protestant king, wearing pearls from a, 
from a Catholic Pope, and this had political meaning at that time. And you see her wearing those pearls proudly. And those pearls were being passed on until they got into Queen Victoria. And because of uh, historical problems that I, I don't have time to explain now, she had to legally give her pearls back to Germany because, uh, because she was a Hanover. But she didn't because she loved the pearls, so she kept the pearls for herself. And those pearls, some of those pearls, you can see on that, on that necklace over there, and some of those pearls you can today see them on this very important crown, which is the Imperial State Crown of Great Britain. And here you can see the Queen wearing the crown and the uh, detail of the crown. And those big, big pearls, those four pearls in the center are actually the Medici pearls. They are 500 years old. And the Queen today wears those pearls only in very special occasions. And it is the bottom necklace here, not the upper one. And those are really, really special. They have a huge history. And the last pearls I'm going to talk about are another very, very, very famous set of pearls that became famous because they costed a lot of money, and not only a lot of money. This, this lady over here, she was married to a very rich gentleman in New York, and she went to Cartier in uh, New York, and she saw these two strands of fantastic pearls. And she went home and said, oh, darling, I want to buy those. I went to Cartier, I want to buy those pearls. And she said, of course, of course, you go and buy. Oh, but there is a problem. What's the problem? It's one million dollars. Of course, everything, he felt everything is, no, no one million dollars. Are you crazy? And he said, no pearl necklace is worth a million dollars. But she decided to prove otherwise. Of course, she had some charms so she could convince him, and he said, okay, I will buy you the necklace. But instead of giving money, they were living on a house in the Fifth Avenue that they didn't like the house anymore. They wanted to move away from the Fifth Avenue. And the house was really a nice house, and it was valued at $1 million. So he said, okay, I will give the house to Cartier plus $100 for expenses, and uh, they will give you the necklace. She was uh, happy all her life. And this is the house in New York that today is the headquarters of Cartier in New York. Imagine the price of this in New York now. But anyway, and, but this is the very good story. In 1957, uh, she, she passed away and her estate was sold at auction. And those pearls were sold by a local auction house. and. Uh, they didn't fetch a very high price. We are talking 1957. And, the, and there are contradicting numbers on the literature. Some say $150,000, some say $180,000. But they were about one-fifth of the original value. I imagine that today, with the market as we have today, if those pearls would emerge again, I'm sure that they, will, they would not want one million. It would be like a lot of millions of dollars. So I would love to, to talk much more about many, many more things, but uh, I don't have time. So I'm, they are ma making me signs, doing like this. God. I would love to speak about um, uh, the Belle Epoque pearls. I didn't say anything about Belle Epoque pearls, more Baroque pearls. But the most important thing is that we covered a few interesting pearls, and we cannot forget pearls in paintings. Paintings are a great way of studying pearling industry, and this is probably one of the most famous pearls ever, which is the girl in the pearl earring from uh, Johannes Vermeer, a 17th century painting. Beautiful pearl, beautiful lady, beautiful painting, beautiful symposium, beautiful people. Thank you very much. Thank you.